Welcome to Have History Will Travel, and thank you for tuning in to another video. In this video, I want to bring to your attention a unique eyewitness account of Pickett's Charge. If you are the least bit vaguely familiar with Gettysburg, you know that Brigadier General Richard Garnett was killed in Pickett's Charge. So, of course, he would not be able to write a report. But his brigade was so demolished during the assault that a major in the 19th Virginia, Charles Payton, took command of it. It is his account I want to read to you today. The reason it is unique is because he was with the regiment as the assault happened, but as officers began falling, this major was left to help command the entire brigade. So I hope you enjoy. Notwithstanding the long and severe marches made by the troops of this brigade, they reached the field about 9 a.m. in high spirits and in good condition. At about 12, we were ordered to take position behind the crest of the hill on which the artillery, under Colonel E. Porter Alexander, was planted where we lay during a most terrific cannonading, which opened at 1.30 p.m. and was kept up without intermission for one hour. During the shelling, we lost about 20 killed and wounded. Among the killed was Lieutenant Colonel J.T. Ellis of the 19th Virginia, whose bravery as a soldier and his innocence, purity, and integrity as a Christian have not only elicited the admiration of his own command, but endeared him to all who knew him. At 2.30 p.m., the artillery fire having to some extent abated, the order to advance was given, first by Major General Pickett in person, and repeated by General Garnett with promptness, apparent cheerfulness, and alacrity. The brigade moved forward at quick time. The ground was open, but little broken, and from 800 to 1,000 yards from the crest whence we started to the enemy's lines. The brigade moved in good order, keeping its line almost perfectly, notwithstanding it had to climb three high posts and rail fences, behind the last of which the enemy skirmishers were first met and immediately driven in. Moving on, we soon met the advanced line of the enemy, line concealed in the grass on the slope about a hundred yards in front of his second line, which consisted of a stone wall about breast high, running nearly parallel to and about thirty paces from the crest of the hill, which was lined with their artillery. The first line referred to above, after offering some resistance, was completely routed and driven in confusion back to the stone wall. Here we captured some prisoners, which were ordered to the rear without a guard. Having routed the enemy here, General Garnett ordered the brigade forward, which it promptly obeyed, loading and firing as it advanced. Up to this time we had suffered but little from the enemy's batteries, which apparently had been much crippled previous to our advance, with the exception of one posted on the mountain about one mile to our right, which enfiladed nearly our entire line with fearful effect, sometimes as many as ten men being killed and wounded by the bursting of a single shell. From the point it had first routed the enemy, the brigade moved rapidly forward towards the stone wall. Under a galing fire, both from artillery and infantry, the artillery using grape and canister, we were now within about seventy-five paces of the wall, unsupported on the right and left. General Kemper being some 50 or 60 yards behind and to the right, and General Armistead coming up in our rear. General Kemper's line was discovered to be lapping on ours, when deeming it advisable to have the line extended to the right, to prevent being flanked, a staff officer rode back to the general to request him to incline to the right. General Kemper not being present, perhaps wounded at the time, Captain W.T. Fry of his staff immediately began his exertions to carry out the request, but in consequence of the eagerness of the men in pressing forward, it was impossible to have the order carried out. Our line, much shattered, still kept up the advance until within about twenty paces of the wall, when for a moment it recoiled under the terrific fire that poured into our ranks, both from their batteries and from the sheltered infantry. At this moment General Kemper came up on the right and General Armistead in rear, when the three lines joining in concert rushed forward with unyielding determination and apparent spirit of laudable rivalry to plant the southern banner on the walls of the enemy. His strongest and last line was instantly gained. The Confederate battle flag waved over its defenses, and the fighting over the wall became hand to hand and of the most desperate character. But more than half having already fallen, our line was found too weak to rout the enemy. We hoped for support on the left, which had started simultaneously with ourselves but hoped in vain. Yet a small remnant remained in desperate struggle, receiving a fire in front, on the right, and on the left, many even climbing over the wall and fighting the enemy in his own trenches 
until entirely surrounded. Those who were not killed or wounded were captured with the exception of about 300 who came off slowly, but greatly scattered, the identity of every regiment being entirely lost and every regimental commander killed or wounded. The brigade went into action with 1,287 men and about 140 officers. As shown by the report of the previous evening, and sustained a loss, as the list of casualties will show, of 941 killed, wounded, and missing, and it is feared from all the information received that the majority of those reported missing are either killed or wounded. Again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Keep a lookout for the newest episode of Historical Newspapers dropping either Thursday or Friday. And as always, you can check out the Facebook, Patreon, and Twitter pages, as well as the Teespring store by clicking on the links below. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.